Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is John Chuang. I'm uh, uh, the professor, associate dean, and head of the School of Information. And most importantly for today, in fact, I'm so happy to share that I was also the dissertation advisor for Nick Merrill. And so it gives me great pleasure to uh, welcome all of you here for this uh, PhD dissertation talk by our very own Dr. Nick Merrill. Um, uh, Nick received his PhD here. Um, when do you file it? Um, about a year ago, less than a year ago. Um, and um, over the years as a PhD student, he really has been uh, pushing us very hard on this intellectual journey on you know what we uh, and uh, what our understanding of you know the capabilities of technologies with regards to you know reading someone's mind and you know communicating by telepathy uh, by you know very much hands-on work on brain computer interface uh, technologies. Uh, many of you know that he spent uh, quite a bit of time working on uh, past thoughts uh, using Brainwave for doing user authentication. Uh, but at the same time, he's not just an engineer or data scientist, he's also you know, a philosopher, a social scientist, who really is passionately uh, uh, engaged with the theories uh, both from you know philosophy, um, computer science, and even from uh, neuroscience, cognitive science. Uh, in, in, in a sense, he is the perfect example of the type of PhD students that we train here at uh, the information school. Someone who really is very uh, holistic in, and in fact you know, open with regards to you know, the different disciplines and theories and then bringing them to bear to you know, some uh, research question that is you know, really very focused, but also of fundamental importance. Uh, you know, I, I can go on uh, with glowing uh, uh, comments about Nick and his work, um, but I am going to really turn this over to him because this really is you know, a chance for us to celebrate all the work that he has done as a PhD student and uh, also, therefore, a celebration uh, more generally for the success of our PhD program. So thank you. Uh, and yes, Nick. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, wow. That was an unexpectedly extremely flattering introduction. Thank you, John. Uh, you also reminded me I forgot to put doctor on the title, but I, I never put doctor anywhere. I heard it's useful for getting uh, restaurant reservations, but I've never tried it outside. clickbait, in my opinion, um, it, what people think machines can know about the mind and why their beliefs matter. So this is not the most obvious question to ask, at least when you get to the subtitle part of it, but I will explain why this question makes sense soon. Uh, before that, though, I want to kind of give you a little history here. Um, when I started this PhD program, uh, you know, John obviously was a professor here, but there was no organized way of doing research about uh, technologies that sense the body. And during my first, or maybe right after my first year of PhD, John and Coy founded the Biosense Group, um, which I joined and, you know, saw grow tremendously. And, and that was really the, the cocoon in which this work was able to form. Um, and we got a very generous seed grant from the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity to pursue this work as well. Uh, so I'm very grateful to both of these institutions, and please keep them in mind as we go throughout this talk. Um, so to give you some context, oh, and one more thing about this. The relationship between maybe sensing the body, cybersecurity, mind reading, maybe not so obvious right now, and my hope is that it'll be a little more obvious when we get to the end of the talk. Okay. Um, but let me start. So. Uh, when, when we were starting this group, John and I, uh, and this work started before I came, uh, were working for a long time on this idea called past thoughts. You may or may not have heard of this idea, but this illustration from a, a, a news report, I think, really is perfect. You know, the idea is that you think your password. Okay, you think a secret thought, and the secret thought allows you to log into things. Okay, so you can see here, okay, I'm thinking my thought, I get it wrong. Thinking my thought, I get it wrong. Thinking my thought, oh, I get it right. I get to, I get to log in. And we use a brain scanning device to pick up on these thoughts. 
Um, I will talk a lot more about the details about how this works. I understand this is a little, like, literally hand wavy right now. Um, but uh, the key point here is that, you know, first of all, we don't get to see, you can't shoulder surf and see what someone's typing as their password. Um, and, you know, the unique way you think your thought is hard for me to forge. Even if I know your secret thought, it would be very difficult for me to, you know, even if you tell me what it is, to, to emulate it in such a way that it'll let you log in. So how do we sense the brain? Well, you know, by the end of, of you know, my time working with this, we've uh, gotten as advanced as using these earbuds. You know, this is really something you just stick in your ear. This is not a bulky device. You know, this is something that we hope could someday be embedded like in your AirPods or something like that, right? Um, so we got, you know, good accuracy, got, you know, met these kind of key performance indicators of technical, uh, uh, you know, progress as far as authentication goes. But as these things go, of course, you know, during PhD, especially in a program like the iSchool, one starts to think about alternative questions. And sometime during my PhD, I discovered uh, this fungus called corticeps. So apparently I'm like the last person in the world to learn about corticeps. So who here already knows about the corticeps fungus? Okay, good, I'm glad that you don't all know about this. I gave this talk a while ago and I was like, yeah, yeah, we know about corticeps. Okay, this, so this fungus is amazing. It takes over this ant's, what I would call this ant's mind, okay? It controls this ant's mind. It, it basically, when the ant is infected, it compels the ant to climb to the underside of a twig and bite down on the twig at which point it will spend the rest of its life, such as it is, uh, becoming a, a medium for fungal reproduction, okay? I will spare you the photo of that. But the interesting part about this, to me, is that this fungus has no presence in the ant's brain. It wraps itself around the ant's muscles and skeletal system uh, to control its behavior. Okay, fine, it's manipulating the muscles, right? Uh, that makes sense. But what's amazing about this to me is that it's able to create a network of sensing and actuation robust enough to, you know, act as a mind, a meta-mind on top of the ant's mind, right? It basically reads and controls the ant without the brain, okay? Uh, it is a bodily sensor and actuator. Uh, so putting aside the actuation part, the fact that one can sense bodies with high enough resolution, sufficiently high resolution, to create a model of what we might call the ant's mind uh, is somewhat amazing, and it made me think of the emerging world of wearable devices, okay? Um, so here's the analogy I wanna kind of give to you. Here's the relationship that I wanna give to you. In past thoughts, if you're thinking about your past thought, you have this experience of thinking about the past thought, right? You have this experience of, let's say, imagining yourself swimming. Uh, and then the device has this model of that experience that it uses for the limited purpose of pattern recognition. The model and the experience are different from another, but the model is good enough to perform this goal, right? Uh, in the case of the ant, the ant has some experience, some ant experience of uh, navigating its world, and this fungus has a model of that experience that is robust enough to control the ant, okay? Again, the model and the experience are potentially different, but there's a relationship such that the model is robust enough for control. And the sensors, you know, in this case, obviously this person has a lived experience of the world, uh, but the model of that person's movement uh, through space, how robust can it be? What can we know about the mind through that model, okay? And what I came through, through the empirical work that I'll share with you today, uh, is this following kind of idea embedded in, in, a, uh, in a kind of graphical form. The idea here is that we have these beliefs about the mind and body, what the mind and body is. These beliefs are ultimately contestable. They are open to, to contestation. And we do throw, so through technologies. As we build and use technologies, we update kind of our ideas about what the mind are. And these beliefs then uh, uh, feed forward into uh, the types of technologies that it seems like we can build. Uh, and this loop is not necessarily error correcting. Okay. We are not necessarily getting closer and closer iteratively to some ground truth about the mind and body. We're in fact, you know, constructing our beliefs about the mind and body through our design and use of technologies. And I am here today to illustrate some tiny pieces of that, um, some kind of provocative dots on a very large canvas 
uh, through uh, just a, really two pieces of work. And there's actually much more work here, but for purposes of minimizing overload, I've picked two studies that I think are provocative, um, and I'm happy to talk about more maybe uh, at the end of Q&A. But the first one we're gonna talk about is this lab-based experiment we did with heart rate. Um, the second one is a technology probe with past thoughts. I will return to past thoughts. And finally, you know, I, I kind of extrapolate here some future work for security. Um, I didn't mention earlier, but I'm now at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, where I run a group called the Daylight Lab, and I will uh, kind of draw the line out to see how I got from A to B there. Um, it does make sense in retrospect. But before we get there, first, let me explain the very start of all of this lab-based study we did with heart rate. So if you think back, way back to 2016, if you dare, uh, their smartwatches were new. The, Iowa, the Apple Watch was new. And it had this feature that I thought was interesting, Coley and I both thought was interesting at that time, which was that it could detect your heart rate. And there was this very, at uh, the surface, unusual feature where you could send your heart rate uh, to somebody else. Does anyone remember this? Okay, some folks remember this, that's good. So there are all these apps, you know, what are we gonna do with heart rate, right? There are all these apps. Uh, this one I, I love, what's your heart telling you? Okay, and, and I think that the, the thing that here basically is that you could track your heart rate and then, you know, when you're at the, the having your Skype interview, you could see if you were nervous or something like that. Um, but so, you know, this caused, you know, Cole and I both to ask ourselves, well, what is your heart telling you? I mean, how do people actually interpret their own heart rate? Uh, and we found some studies that are as early as 1974 uh, where basically people were given controlled experiments where they were told that they were listening to their heart rate and that heart rate was manipulated to be either high or low. And the findings of these studies are that uh, high heart rate, people believe that they are more negative feeling, feeling more negative, feeling more anxious, okay? Um, basically, if you're strapped into a chair, given a heart rate thing, and you're just you know, told that your heart rate is high, you're hearing a heart rate, you believe it's yours and it's high, you evaluate yourself as being anxious. Interesting, um, but going back to the question that, asked, that app asked, uh, uh, what's your heart rate telling someone else? If you share your heart rate with someone, what does that communicate to that person? What is really the interpretive affordance of heart rate? So for this study, we focused on trust. Uh, trust when something is on the line, in this case money. Uh, trust is this you know, very fundamental construct in social psychology. Uh, it's the presence in all pairs, dyadic pairs, and we'll focus on dyadic pairs here uh, for the sake of simplicity. And we'll use a, a prisoner's dilemma experiment, which I'll explain in a second. But first, here were our hypotheses kind of derived from those uh, studies on one's own heart rate. So first hypothesis, participants who consistently see an elevated heart rate from their partner will rate their partner more negatively on mood attributes compared to if they see a normal heart rate. Again, straightforward from the studies on one's own heart rate, we assume they will think about you what they would think about themselves based on past work. Hypothesis number two, participants who see an elevated heart rate from their partner will trust work less and cooperate less. You know, if that person's in a negative mood, if that person is, you know, uh, more negative on mood attributes, maybe I don't trust them, maybe they're not, you know, gonna do me right and I'm gonna be less likely to trust and cooperate with them. So we used a lab study, we had 56 subjects recruited from UC Berkeley, 41 women, 14 men, and one non-binary with a mean age of 21. And we performed, as I said, an iterated prisoner's dilemma. So if you've never heard of a prisoner's dilemma, don't worry, I'll walk you through it, and I'll walk you through the very specific version of a prisoner's dilemma that we did in our study. So prisoner's dilemma, again, dyadic pairs, imagine there are two people, okay. Uh, now, in this experiment, mostly in these experiments, you don't see the person you're with. It's not a face-to-face -face relationship. It's computer mediated. So everyone's sitting in front of a, a you know, cubicle with a screen in front of them, and they were told that they were matched with somebody else in the room. Unbeknownst to them, they're actually matched with a robot that we wrote, a little automated agent, but they believed it was a, a human player in the room that they were paired with. So the way that prisoners' dilemmas work, you have this opportunity in iterative cycles to either cooperate or defect on your partner, and also to trust your partner with points. So first you kind of donate some points to them, and if they earn those points to you, then those points double in value. So now the rational thing to do is to always give your partner the maximum number of points and just agree to always return those points, and then you both get as rich as possible. That is not what we observe in practice. In practice, we observe that people give a few points and then make sure that they're cool, and that I'm cool, and if we're both cool, then we slowly work the, the number of points up that we're willing to contribute. 
So we were going to support that, but what we wanted to make sure for was that we, we wanted to control for the behavior of the player's partner. We wanted to make sure that the partner was always cooperative, hence the bot, okay? So this robot always returned the player's points. Regardless of how much they entrusted, they entrusted roughly the same amount, plus or minus one point, okay? Again, just emulating kind of a, a perfectly cooperative human partner. So here's what could happen. Basically, if the human cooperates, the robot always cooperates. So if the human cooperates, they get double points. And if the human facts, that is, says, I'm actually going to take your points, then, you know, the, the human gets to keep the, the, the bot's points, gets to keep the partner's points, um, and, and the, uh, the robot loses out. But again, bot will not, you know, retaliate next time. Bot will always cooperate. Okay, so here's the key manipulation we added to our study. Right after you entrust the points, right after you make the decision about whether you're going to cooperate or defect, uh, you put all your, or I guess, yeah, you put your finger on a scanner, right? You, you put your finger on what, a heart rate scanner, and we were told they were, you know, measuring your, we're measuring your heart rate, and we're going to send that heart rate to your partner. And so the player does this, and then, you know, they, they make their decision, and then they're shown this screen, your partner's heart rate. Okay, so they see either one of two conditions. Your partner's heart rate was normal or your partner's heart rate was elevated. And again, you know, the, the player is left to infer that their partner is also seeing their heart rate. So there's a reciprocal relationship implied here. So they were put into one of these, either an elevated condition or a normal condition. And every time, no matter what happened, no matter what they entrusted, no matter what they decided to do, they were shown that their partner's heart rate was normal every time, or in the other condition, they were shown that their partner's heart rate was elevated Every time, okay? It's the only difference. So what happened? Well, uh, we see some differences in, uh, in the, the, first of all, these are how people rated their partner. Was your partner anxious? Was your partner calm? Was your partner easily upset? These were just evaluations we gave after the experiment via survey. So what did we detect? Well, there are definitely differences between anxiety and calmness here. If your partner's heart rate was normal, you rated them as less anxious, you rated them as more calm, okay? That is somewhat intuitive. If they had an elevated heart rate, they're more anxious, they're less calm. We did not see an effect for easily upset and emotional. I don't know exactly why this is, but I think our best guess here is that kind of easily upset, emotional, these are long-term personality characteristics. Maybe people don't really believe that heart rate can tell you things about long-term personality characteristics, but they can, you, you know, the people in our study believed, can tell you things about your emotional state in the moment. Are you ang anxious? Are you calm? Heart rate, maybe, people believe, can say something to that. Okay, now here's where it really gets interesting. We saw here is that when you see an elevated heart rate, you cooperate less with your partner. You co cooperate less frequently with your partner. This is partial support for our second hypothesis. Uh, we do see a real behavioral effect when, uh, when heart rate is exchanged if the heart rate is not, as you know, deemed to be elevated, okay? And it's a negative, you know, it's, a, it's an antisocial, what we would call behavioral effect, right? So to dig a little bit deeper into this quantitative data, don't worry, we did collect qualitative data as well. We asked uh, participants afterward, what did heart rate tell you about your partner? So here are some examples from the elevated heart rate condition. People said stuff like, well, you know, it told me how excited he or she was, told me whether he or she cheated. Okay, that's interesting. Or it was elevated all the time, so I think, you know, he or she is just anxious, so I guess he or she did not completely trust me, right? My partner's heart rate was elevated the whole time. Well, most students are stressed, so that's why. So this is kind of a grab bag, but we do see this trend here, right? People believe that this elevated heart rate really reveals something about what their partner thought about them. It was taken to be the social cue, what do you think about me, right? And now, just to kind of verify, let's look to the normal heart rate condition. Well, heart rate signaled that my partner was always calm, right? If I had contradicted them, their heart rate probably would have changed in response. Okay, so, you know, this partner, they, you know, they, I guess this partner never defected on their, on their uh, uh, simulated partner, um, which is great, maybe because their heart rate was elevated, we don't know. Uh, but certainly there are some emotional cues being read here through heart rate, that much is clear, and it is, you know, having some robust effect on people's behaviors, people's social behavior. So the question here immediately was, how specific is this finding to heart rate? Does this really have to do with the heart, or would this have happened with any elevated versus normal signal from the body? Okay, 
So what we did was we tried to replicate this experiment. Everything was exactly the same, except we replaced every mention of the word heart rate with SRI. We made up SRI. No idea what SRI is. Okay. We, we called it skin reflectivity index. We did not explain what this meant. We don't know what this means. Um, and we ran it, we tried to run it exactly the same way. We ended up burning one group because we, they did it and they said, I think it's just heart rate. So we made one simple change as well, which is instead of putting your finger on it, you put your hand over it, and somehow that was good enough and people didn't say anything about heart rate anymore. Okay, so we ran the experiment again. What happened? Well, this behavioral effect disappeared. Okay, why? why? What happened? So again, to the qualitative data, here is an example from the elevated SRI condition. Well, since their SRI was always high and they always gave the money back to me, I assume the two are correlated. And an elevated SRI means that they're gonna give the money back. I guess it means they're trustworthy. Okay, opposite of what they said about heart rate. Normal SRI condition. Well, it shows how anxious or nervous someone is if their SRI is high. Remember, this participant never said SRI. They were in the normal SRI condition. Second, a person is less likely to trust the other people if she, he or she has a high SRI. Again, this person never saw a high SRI. They were in the normal SRI condition. But both meant whatever it is that you saw, you thought, and meant they're trustworthy. Okay, what's going on here? My takeaway here is that, you know, again, thinking to this loop, thinking about this loop, and we didn't have this loop at the time, but I'm, I'm imposing retroactively onto this loop because it's a good way of understanding, right? I think, hopefully it is. So when you're using a technology, you're taking your beliefs about the mind, whatever they are, and you're really you know, applying them to the way that you use the technology. We saw that in heart rate. If you believe something about heart rate, and of course you know, we have our lived experiences in our body, there are cultural reasons why we believe particular things about heart rate. If you believe something about a signal like heart rate, it affects the way you use technologies. And of course it affects the way you treat other people when mediated through those technologies. Now on the other hand, these technologies and the absence of prior belief, something like SRI, we can actually teach you a new belief about the body, right? We, we saw completely different, completely in some ways opposite uh, reactions to the same signal just because we manipulated people's prior beliefs, the degree to which they had prior beliefs about this signal. And this illuminates, I think, these two interesting, you know, disparate points on this loop, right? Now what we did not learn from the study is anything on the building side. Okay, so we did you know, another follow-up study I'm gonna to talk to you about now, a technology probe with past thoughts, and we, we did this technology probe with software engineers. But before I tell you about software engineers, a topic I love, I do wanna take a brief detour. Now is the time to talk a little bit more about past thoughts, talk a little bit more about the brain and the mind as it, as it is. Okay, so we have this brain. I think we're all familiar with this. We all have one of these, right? Let's say you wanna know what's going on inside it. Classic problem, it's in the skull. Skull is difficult to penetrate, it's inconvenient, it's painful, you know, we don't wanna do that if we don't have to. So what we're kind of left doing, at least, you know, from a practical, inexpensive standpoint, the brain produces electromagnetic radiation as a, a you know, in the course of its function, the patterns of neuro, uh, neurons and synapses firing, uh, produce kind of patterns of, of constructive and destructive interference that produce what we colloquial, co colloquially call brain waves, uh, electromagnetic radiation. So we wanna detect that, we wear something like this, right? Okay, no, we don't want that. Uh, increasingly, these, these sensors, we call them electroencephalography, EEG sensors, these EEG sensors look like this. Very sleek, they're produced by, you know, uh, uh, very slick companies with lots of VC funding. Uh, one of the more modern of these devices looks like this. Uh, this is the Muse headband. Uh, you know, it definitely looks like something's on your head, but it's, it's a headband, right? Um, it doesn't look overly clunky. Now, the question you may be asking is fine, you know, we can sense the brain through these inexpensive devices, but uh, what can they actually tell us about what's going on in the brain? Okay. Well, the analogy I like to use here is the baseball stadium. Um, don't worry, you don't need to know about baseball. This is not a sports analogy. Con key concept here, lots of people screaming, right? Uh, so the analogy here is that EEG is kind of like putting, let's say, four microphones around the stadium at some distance. You're not gonna be able to pick up on individual conversations in the baseball stadium, okay? You will be able to tell if people are screaming louder in one part than the other. You'll be able to tell how loud the screams are overall, but this is the kind of coarse, kind of gross feedback 
that we're able to get from EEG. It is in some sense remarkable we can do anything with it. it turns out we can, but, but it is not a fine-grained uh, uh, way of, of sensing the brain, at least in, you know, especially not in the consumerist kind of uh, devices I showed you a second ago. Nevertheless, software engineers have been thinking a lot about EEG lately. This was a couple years ago now, but you know, someone at Facebook got up on stage in front of like 1,000 people uh, you know, with the cameras there and said, we are going to allow users to type with their brains. Um, so let's not think too hard about why Facebook wants to know what's going on in our brains, but nevertheless, they do. They're working on it, right? And there were these breathless headlines, brain-machine interface isn't sci-fi anymore. Clearly something is going on with brain-computer interface in Silicon Valley. And around this time as well, there were all, there's this explosion of uh, consumer devices that, you know, read the brain. Some of these, I think, are, have been launched and were prototypes when, we, when this work came out. There's a lot, there was a lot of energy and continues to be a lot of energy around sensing the brain. So, you know, you can order a lot of these devices from these, these producers today. The question we really had in mind at this time, motivated by our past work, is how do Silicon Valley software engineers conceive of brain-computer interfaces and their capabilities? How do they conceive of the mind and brain in relation to these capabilities? Uh, it's great to have this device. Uh, you know, certainly John and I think they're interesting. We have some, some uh, uses in mind for it, as we'll discuss a little bit more in a second. And the only reason why these devices are coming out, we believe, is that engineers and investors, you know, the, the kind of machine or the machinations behind uh, technical produ production in general, believe that there's something there, something in the technical infrastructure, and, and something in the mind and brain that can be read through these devices, and we wanted to know what exactly that was. So we took, again, this device I showed you earlier, the Interaxon Muse, and we brought it into the field, so, you know, basically the field being software engineering startups and companies, and we gave it to professional software engineers. In their place of work, we sat down with them and put the device on their head and, and gave them a live past thoughts experience. And I will talk to you a little bit more about past thoughts in a second, uh, but first, I think, question, reasonable question to ask at this point, which engineers? Okay, what, what engineers? There are a lot of software engineers out there, which ones? So we wanted people who had no prior experience developing BCIs. If you've ever worked with BCIs, you know the limitations. We wanted people who were maybe on that next frontier, who have not yet experienced developing with BCIs. Um, you know, uh, we're anticipating the expansion of the practice around BCIs. We're looking toward uh, people who haven't done it yet. And these folks are probably also a little more comfortable extrapolating. Um, and people have, you know, really gotten their hands dirty and been out in the weeds. However, we, we wanted engineers who had a stated interest in tinkering with BCIs. Uh, there's great work on this, uh, including, you know, Anno Saxanian's kind of classic work uh, about Silicon Valley. There is a long, long history of hacking and tinkering in Silicon Valley driving commercial development. And we wanted folks who are likely to partake in this heritage, as these are the people who, again, you know, historically speaking, may be most likely to produce devices that get deployed, okay? Produce software infrastructures that get deployed. So our goals here were to get engineers talking about the future of BCIs and their beliefs about that future and about the mind and brain as it relates to that future. And we used this, this method from design research called a probe. Uh, probe is, you know, a working technical artifact. We deploy it with people and we observe how they use the artifact uh, in order to draw, you know, some inductive uh, uh, kind of data out and, you know, make, 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 some, uh, make some inferences from, from that data. Uh, in this case, our probe was a working brain-computer interface. It was the past thoughts authenticator I'll describe to you in a second. And our goal here with this interface, and keep this in mind as I show you the interface we, we did, because otherwise you're going to be like, what is wrong with you? We wanted to activate engineers' professional vision, okay? These engineers, the software engineers, spent all their time in text editors debugging stuff on a terminal. We wanted them to approach this from their professional kind of point of view, from the place of professional expertise. So we got eight software engineers, three of them were women, uh, 23 to 36, all of them working in the San Francisco Bay Area, and over a one-hour session, we went into their place of work and, and use this authenticator. And again, I'm not saying that it's only engineers in the San Francisco Bay Area who matter. However, historically speaking, these engineers have had an outsized impact on the kinds of technologies that, that get widely deployed. 
they're interesting to study for that reason alone. So here's how past thoughts works, schematically, okay? Uh, we get some example readings from you, and, and again, you know, in the real past thought system, you think a secret thought, uh, we, kind of, we kind of occluded that part for simplicity to make it kind of easier to train in the wild, in the field. So we just recorded some sample readings from this, this participant, just their brainwaves, whatever they were doing was fine. We collected this corpus of readings from the participant, and we brought to the table some pre-recorded readings from people who weren't them. And we use these to train uh, on the fly a binary classifier. And yes, this took a minute. You know, we entertained the participants with some idle chit chat while it trained. At the end of that process, we were left with a trained binary classifier that was producing either uh, accept or reject when they wore their headset. Okay, they put their headset on, and what was coming out of that classifier was either accept or reject. You are who you say you are, or you are not who you say you are. Okay. Here's how we visualize that. Uh, we had a stream of text coming by on a uh, terminal screen. Uh, this is the simplest thing that could possibly work, uh, and it is also, in some sense, comfortable for engineers who, again, are used to working in their terminal. Uh, this is like a debug view, and we wanted them, we wanted to, you know, kind of pull the curtains back here and show them this is uh, not, you know, a, a slick, you know, well-produced product. This is something that's, you know, clearly in the stages of development. In addition, it is not entirely accurate, as you can see. You might interpret this as an accept signal. Uh, after all, the majority are green, zeros, meaning accept. But there are, you know, a smattering of, of rejects there as well. Uh, the display is intrinsically ambiguous. And again, drawing on, you know, lots of work in HCI, Bill Gaver and others, there is room for interpretation in, in ambiguity, and that is exactly the kind of an, uh, 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 interpretation we wanted to draw out here. So again, this might be a reject signal. Most of, most but not all of the ter determinations are reject. And you might also see just a completely ambiguous case where, you know, we're not sure if this is an accept or reject. But imagine, remember, imagine you're sitting down, this device is on your head, and you're just seeing these numbers scroll across the screen in real time. Uh, it's like, you know, one number every half of a second. So it's really scrolling by. And we just had the engineers sit there with the devices and think aloud to us, just talk to us about it. We just engaged them, you know, there was a semi-structured interview protocol, but we engaged them in open-ended conversation about, uh, about, you know, their experiences and, and what they were thinking and noticing about this. So uh, there are a lot of results we have here. I'm going to pick two for you that I think really kind of, you know, elucidate and complete this narrative. The first is that engineers had really diverse beliefs about what the mind is. I'll talk about those in a second. However, they had a shared belief, a very strong belief in all cases, that machines will read the mind some way, somehow. All right, so first, these diverse beliefs about what the mind is. Now, we may all have different beliefs about what the mind is, okay? And, and I don't have time to go into it. I would love to go into it, but it's not entirely clear what the mind is, uh, as it turns out. Many people believe the brain is the same thing as the mind. The mind is entirely contained just in this little region right here. Uh, and, you know, often I find, especially in these software engineers, they tended to believe that the brain is the mind, is a computer. The brain is taking these inputs, and producing these outputs with the muscles or whatever, and that's just a computation. That's just a computation process. That's the mind, that's it, okay? Or, second belief I noticed, the mind is potentially more expansive than the brain. And I was surprised to find this belief because this is, you know, the stuff of philosophy, but again, you know, engineers, they have lots of different backgrounds, lots of different beliefs. A couple, couple engineers, you know, believed or at least expressed the belief that the mind is potentially more expansive than the brain that it extends into the body, potentially even into the environment. And finally, you know, a few people uh, believe that the mind and the brain are just intrinsically social constructs. There's no logical bottom. There's no there there. Uh, we just make up, you know, what the, what the mind and brain are. Yeah, maybe they're correlated with physical phenomena, but, you know, there's no, there's no real uh, uh, brute, brute truth or brute fact to the mind or brain. So lots of beliefs about what the mind or brain is here, okay? Lots and lots of beliefs about, about the mind. Uh, however, all of these people, despite their beliefs, all thought that the mind can and will be read by machines. Here's one example. Uh, well, we're driven by single-celled organisms in ways we don't really understand, but there's got to be some sort of physical storage to memories or experiences. 
we just haven't quite learned how to read it yet. Okay, so this engineer, again, doesn't necessarily believe that the mind is entirely contained in this brain that's you know, being in some sense read by the device. You know, they're, they're single-celled organisms, they drive our behavior, and perhaps this is a, an aspect of mind. However, it's physical, and we will read it, right? Or, you know, here's where I borrowed the logical bottom from, the mind may have no logical bottom, but practically, this has no implication. We could still devise an authentication tool that does the job. Maybe in some way they, way they could do this ESP thing, where you could somehow read my thoughts. If we want to do something, we will find a way. Okay. I, I love this quote. You know, I think sometimes it's easy to assume that engineers view the world in a mechanistic way. Uh, and that is certainly not always true. You know, this engineer and other engineers I talked to as well, uh, they definitely believe that you know, the world in some sense is subject to this discursive kind of boundary work. They understand that they perform that boundary work as they build technologies. Um, and you know, that's part of why we do this work. It's not just to kind of suck and extract the beliefs out from engineers, but also to understand you know, how to meet engineers where they are so that we can you know, intervene and, and reach out and create some common understanding, which I'll talk about a bit more later. So what we have here, I think, is you know, a little slice of how these beliefs about the mind and body make the kinds of technologies people see as, as possible to build. And these engineers, you know, amazingly do believe that it will be possible to build technologies that read the mind through the various kinds of beliefs that they have about what that mind is. What we don't have yet, and what I'm desperately curious to know a little bit more about, about how those technologies are going away to affect uh, uh, the new things people build, which again, structure our beliefs about the mind and body. You know, my theory here is that we will be soon undergoing some more discursive work in which our beliefs, our general societal beliefs about the mind and brain will be challenged or revised through novel sensing technologies. Poly technologies that you know, increasingly sense mind, mood, emotion, and you know, even since filing uh, this PhD work, I've seen you know, a million times you know, governments surveilling people using cameras to see what they're feeling. Uh, these are going to update our beliefs about the mind and brain. And that, in turn, you know, will, will uh, affect the kinds of technologies that we end up building. And those technologies will, again, affect the beliefs about the mind and, and body. And, and this loop will continue. Um, and, and, you know, uh, before moving on to security here, you know, what does this mean for the mind? Uh, how are minds and machines always already kind of entangled with each other? Was there ever this idea about the mind without also this mechanistic idea of a machine uh, with which to, to relate or compare the mind? How do we remake minds through the things that sense them? You know, as we build products, how are we in fact rebuilding this concept of the mind? And how are mind and security already entangled too? You know, I, I think a lot about security, I'll talk a lot more about it in a minute, but my suspicion here is that security has always had a lot to do with this concept of the mind, this concept of privacy, and the mind is this thing that is the, the intrinsic ground truth of privacy. Um, so with, with those interesting questions, and I do think they're very interesting questions, I wanna move on uh, briefly to some future work that I see for security, and security is where I, I spend a lot of my time now. So, you know, what, is, what does this work mean for security? Well, obviously with mind reading machines, there may be mismatches between what designers believe and what users believe. We don't know if that's the case, but I have some evidence that it is. Um, I suspect that surveillance studies, although it hasn't looked at mind reading uh, in particular, probably has a lot to teach us. Uh, you know, there, there is a racial history of surveillance uh, and, you know, certainly something I learned a lot about learning about surveillance studies. These same tools are often reappropriated as tools of activism and resistance. I think that as we look toward this new frontier of sensing, we would do well to study uh, in much greater depth, you know, surveillance studies and, and what we might be able to learn from surveillance studies as we evaluate, you know, critically these new devices. Um, also, you know, I couldn't help but notice that engineers were able to speculate about the future in this very interesting and flexible way. And I wonder if the speculative capacity could itself surface novel threats. I mean, we came up with one possible novel security risk here uh, about mind reading and so on, but there are others out there as well. 
And uh, I, I bet you that you know, this, this speculative capacity can be useful in servicing threats broadly. So stay tuned for more work on that. It is something I'm thinking about. Um, now for some really, really concrete takeaways. Uh, one thing that came up, and I didn't get a chance to talk about this work in great depth, but we did do a lot of surveys with what people believe about like broad ranges of sensing devices. I have some backup slides, and if we have time, I can talk about it. But one thing that emerged through all of this work, including the stuff I didn't show you, is that uh, users are sometimes uh, believe certain kinds of sensors to be innocent. GPS can't really reveal anything about the mind. Turns out there, in reality, there's a ton of work on using GPS to like tell if you're depressed or something like that. Um, you know, we can complain about that work from a methodological perspective, but there are people who try to detect like mental health uh, incidents from GPS traces. Users don't tend to know about these things. Okay, they tend to think that these things are innocent. To me, that is a problem. On the other hand, uh, designers should be aware of the seemingly creepy. Uh, users overall tend to think that brain scanning devices are gonna reveal like everything that they're thinking and feeling, their political beliefs, stuff like that. Uh, I can tell you having worked with BCIs for a very long time, they cannot do that. We are not, you know, unless we really give you some like very, very targeted uh, stimuli, if you're just wearing this device and meditating, we're not gonna tell uh, uh, too much about what really the inner parts of your mind. Uh, nevertheless, you know, designers may not be uh, on the same page with users on this, and designers should be aware that certain devices seem creepy to users. Uh, and the users may not be the smiling or semi-smiling person uh, with, the, with the headband. Uh, they may actually be really freaked out by the device, and these mismatches matter. Okay, so what can we do about these mismatches? So I was down at a conference uh, and I saw, you know, this sign, which I thought was really funny. Uh, I see the sign everywhere, but something about it being Disneyland Resort made it even funnier to me, right? I, I think we're all kind of immune to this sign. But, but it does kind of make me wonder about a possible analogy. You know, warning, this product collects data known to the state of California to reveal information about mental health conditions. Uh, there's really nothing like this. And if people don't know what causes, you know, certain data uh, to be collected or causes certain data to be sensitive, we have to do something, I think, to educate users about the, the potential uses of their data. Now, how would this be implemented in the back end? I mean, are we gonna have kind of a state-run database of like peer-reviewed work where people have used inferences to create, uh, you know, use data to create inferences about, about you know, sensitive uh, mind-related meanings? I, I don't really know how that would work, but it is an interesting thought experiment to consider how we might communicate better to users the risks associated with intimate data. And speaking broadly, you know, uh, from that position, I started to wonder and continue to wonder a lot, who gets to identify the harms of technology? You know, I, I spent five years of my life in, a, you know, and this is a literal ivory tower, right? Uh, identifying this one possible harm of technology. And it creates a, tr just requires a tremendous amount of privilege to be able to do that. I don't think we can expect, uh, uh, you know, every software engineer under kind of the constraints of, of you know, private sector to, to do this work. And I certainly don't think we can expect, you know, activists who are thinking about other issues entirely uh, to do this work too, even though they're, they are the ones who are most likely, you know, most affected uh, by these technical developments. So, you know, what comes next? This model is not sustainable. How do we transition this ability to identify security threats to a broader and more diverse set of people? Uh, what do those practices look like? You know, how do we teach? I don't think we can ask everyone to do a PhD at the iSchool, as wonderful a world as that might be. What can we do to democratize? And I'm you know, not sure about the word democratize, but to spread uh, this ability to identify threats. So right now, what I've been doing, you know, what I've been spending a lot of time doing is uh, running this Daylight Security Research Lab at the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Our concern is really with how people understand the harms of technology. And I use security very broadly here, as you may have noticed, to, to, to talk about all of the possible harms of technology. How do people understand these harms and these threats? How do they identify these threats? And how can we shift the way they understand and identify these threats. So please, you know, if you're interested, you can check us out online, daylight.berkeley.edu. Uh, very easy URL to remember, I hope, daylight.berkeley.edu. And with that, you know, I would like to thank all of the wonderful people that I worked with uh, throughout this uh, uh, dissertation process. Their support 
was unbelievable. Uh, many of them are in the room, so thank you for seeing this work for the nth time. I want to give special thanks to John Chuang, uh, my advisor and you know, giver of that lovely introduction, Koi Cheshire, Alvin Noe, everyone in the Biosense group uh, who gave me such amazing feedback. Again, you know, Biosense and the Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity and the School of Information for supporting what is objectively a very risky topic. Uh, so thank you. Um, so I'm Nick Merrill, and with that, I'll turn over to questions. All right, we've got a roaming mic for questions, it looks like. Hey, Nick. Hey. Thanks for the great talk. Thank it's you. really cool to see it all put together. I've seen pieces of it in places. Um, I was wondering, when you were talking about both the heart rate study and the, um, like the work with engineers, um, if you've gotten a sense or if people talked about where their beliefs came from, mm. um, I've been like studying empathy a lot recently and I'll, like how sometimes how people try to imagine how someone else feels is by like projecting how they themselves feel in the situation. Um, did people have ideas of like what heart rate or brain activity meant from like their own experience or did you, or was it media driven or did people talk about that at all? Right, that's a great question. Uh, you know, the honest answer is that we didn't look a tremendous amount about where these beliefs came from. You know, kind of the hand wave that I use through a lot of this work is they come from a lot of different places and people may not be qualified to really introspect and understand where those beliefs actually did come from. Um, I mean, why do you believe that elevated heart rate makes you seem anxious? I actually don't know. I mean, I think I have the experience of my heart beating out of my chest when I'm very nervous. I don't know that that's a learned or, or you know, innate response. I just don't know. Um, and delving into that stuff for every sensor was daunting and potentially out of scope. Uh, what we learned that I think is more surprising and more interesting is that those beliefs have, you know, different ways of being updated or learned. Uh, so with something like heart rate with which you might already be familiar, for whatever reason, it seems difficult for us to override that belief. Even with this incredibly trusting partner who's always returning your points, you still believe, you, you, believe that, uh, you know, this elevated heart rate means that they're less trustworthy. And when we do the same thing with a, a signal that you don't know about, suddenly you are able to learn this new meaning around that signal, right? So where do beliefs come from? Uh, you know, complex. Uh, but we did identify one place that beliefs come from, potentially, which is technologies. When you don't know the signal, novel signal, novel signals happen all the time with these sensing technologies, as, as, as I know both of us know. Uh, with these novel signals, we can teach new beliefs about the mind and body. And that is the one, I think, source of, of, of belief that was incredibly interesting to us and you know, really sparkled through this work. So. Thanks. Well, if we don't have too many questions, let me show. Oh, we got one more. Okay. Um, if technology is kind of used in this cycle, as you described, to um, identify and then teach these kind of new beliefs about the mind and body, um, is it seems like there's a potential for different avenues people could go down. Either the belief that you, as a researcher, have, and then you create technology to show that this example is of this mind and this action of mind and body, or someone else could go down a different route. Um, do you see the belief, if not the understanding of the mind and body to go down these separate channels, or do you think it's going to more converge into what is really going on, whether that's right. signals or... Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, I think if I understand the question, please correct me if I don't. I think the question is, you know, do we do we believe that people are going to uh, uh, update their beliefs about the mind and body to converge on some ground truth? In other words, is this going to be an error correcting process? Um, you know, for me, that's a difficult question to answer because after you know spending a lot of time delving into philosophy of mind, having a philosopher of mind on my committee, it seems pretty unclear what that ground truth is. We actually really don't know. So the question is, is this a process of discovery whereby that ground truth will be uh, uh, determined? Or is there no there there to begin with? 
Is this just really, you know, some terms that have been historically convenient that are getting, whose boundaries are getting moved around as we, you know, learn more about uh, the mind and brain. Daniel Griffin, who's with us today, uh, recommended a great book to me, I for temporarily forget the name, about how, you know, at some point in history, we looked at the brain as mechanical watch. Because we had a lot of mechanical watches around. What a great analogy, right? And come the 1960s, suddenly the brain is a computer, right? And I don't know that we are really any closer to understanding any ground truth that maps on to some term that we have had for, you know, much longer than these technologies. I do believe that all trends will continue and these, you know, sensing device within limits and these, you know, these sensing devices will continue to update the metaphors and, and processes we use to understand, you know, and, and answer questions and make predictions about the mind. And, and I think that is really where the threat comes in. Because as we, you know, let these uh, assumptions be smuggled in by new technologies, we also allow, you know, uh, maybe other assumptions or beliefs to be smuggled into what normative values exist around who gets to know what about the mind and brain, right? Sure, yeah, craniology is a great example too. And you know, I, I, I didn't get a chance to talk as explicitly about it in this talk, but I think you know we're all intuitively familiar with the fact that data tends to get funneled up through positions, two positions of higher and higher power, right? And uh, and I think we're all you know aware of this with behavioral tracking. Um, and I think as we look toward the mind and brain. Uh, maybe this is a somewhat arbitrary barrier where it's like, wow, that is really not what we want to have happen, right? So again, this comes to, you know, more and more kind of the, the ecologies around data that I think make this topic and these questions dynamic and relevant instead of just philosophy of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nick. I, I really like that um, near the end where you had the kind of like Prop 65 warning oh, about sure. like data for users. Uh, and I'm, you know, in, in one way, it's like an interesting kind of like design intervention potentially or like legal, like all entangled. Um, but what about, um, have you thought about similar types of interventions but on like the building engineering side, whether that's talking to engineers about um, like the kind of data harms or in just like educational forms about thinking about like mind and body, but towards that kind of building side rather than the use side. Yeah, that's a great idea. So the concept is, you know, going to talk to some software engineers and saying, hey, it looks like, you know, you're collecting some location data there. Have you considered that it's potentially possible to, you know, tell if users are depressed from that data? Yeah, that's really interesting. I think it would be cool to find a field site and you know the only thing that comes to mind is that it depends a lot on the culture of the the you know company that's developing the product. They may say, "Wow, thank you for telling us. That's really awesome." Or they may say, "Oh, you know, I really don't need to know about this. Uh, maybe you should talk to our legal team." Or you know, um, I do think that intervening at the design stage is important, and that's something that you know we do a lot in daylight. We are interested in the design stage, and when we think about it. Um, this consumer-facing stage is interesting to me because it has such direct analogies and policies that already exist. Um, I think both are interesting policy interventions, potentially. Yeah. Thanks. Hey, Nick. <laughs> Great job. Love the Thank talk. You. I'm not biased, I just loved it, of course. Um, but seriously, uh, my question for you, uh, which I've been meaning to ask you this for actually for a while, because we haven't talked about it in a while. Um, what, are there any particular sensors or data that's now being collected, now given your new role and the stuff you're working on, that you're especially interested in or maybe even concerned about what people might be inferring or learning? Because, I mean, you, you talk quite a bit about this, about, you know, again, the heart rate study and, like, how SRI, like, people make these inferences. And in that case, it was fairly potentially benign, right? Because it's like, oh, maybe they're more trusting. But I wonder, with the rise of different wearables and new kinds of sensors, whether you have specific concerns about some of the things you're seeing where you're worried people might be making inferences that might be erroneous or dangerous? Right, uh, great question. We haven't talked about this in a while. I haven't done anything about this yet, but um, I have seen a lot of interest in cameras and, and emotion tracking from web cameras. And I know, you know, in Biosense, we talked about this all the time because there are so many tools that track uh, uh, emotion from webcams. What I have noticed in the past maybe four months 
is that for whatever reason, now people who know nothing about the field, I say I work in security, immediately they say, did you know that you can detect someone's emotion from a webcam? And I think that this pop popularization of that, and especially it's, it's to, to questions in surveillance, especially state-run surveillance by certain very particular actors, uh, makes an interesting case study for how these beliefs are getting actively updated by events in the world. And I would like to dive a little bit more into, uh, into cameras. Also, you know, I think um, there hit a critical mass maybe about a year ago, I might be a little wrong on the timing, where people understood you need to cover up your webcam. Or more and more people started to cover up their webcam that I saw. Um, or, you know, that, that was the thing that came up. So something about the camera, maybe it's legibility to the eye, it's in metaphor to the eye, um, is to me makes it really interesting. And, and pair that, you know, with this uh, very active interest in this one aspect of mind, emotion, um, and the relationship to kind of the camera, I think that's, that's cool to study. For anyone out there with time. Hi, uh, great talk. Um, I just have a question which uh, concerns the, um, the cycle you mentioned um, sure. between the beliefs and um, the technologies we develop. How likely would you say that, um, okay, <laughs> so first our beliefs are supposed to impact and guide basically our, our behaviors. We, we, could, we could say that, we could agree on that, right? Uh, but then if the perception we have of the technologies we create or can imagine um, make us behave in a certain way, how much do you think that the kind of erroneous conception we have of those technologies can actually make us behave and think in completely uh, different ways. So for instance, uh, as an example, I would use the, um, the, the, the attention span we have, uh, the evolution of our attention, attention span in uh, the, the recent years and how much like we went from 18 seconds to two seconds uh, on each article we came, we came across. So how much would you say that Believing that technology makes us behave in a certain way actually impacts uh, our like the, the 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 genetics behind how our minds uh, function. Yeah, so a uh, lot of interesting stuff in that question. I definitely agree with you. Beliefs and behaviors are tightly related to one another. I also completely agree with you that you know the way we embed our beliefs in technologies will themselves feed back into our beliefs. And again, that is not necessarily an error correcting process, right? We will potentially form new beliefs. What I hesitate to say is that our beliefs are erroneous. I think, you know, certainly academic uh, uh, circles may say one thing about the mind and body. Uh, technologists may say one thing about the mind and body. Users may say one thing about the mind and body. It's certainly the case that engineers are in this power position and getting to embed their beliefs into technologies, and users will have to you know, account for or, or at least encounter those beliefs as they use the technologies implicitly or explicitly. And I agree with you also you know, that, that those technologies may change the way that users, whoever they may be, including you know, academics like me, think about the mind and brain. And, and certainly technologies have always had a tight relationship to our behavior. Um, so these really are the questions. You know, these are the fundamental questions. Um, what, you know, and I don't have a reasonable answer for them, but, but raising the question in this way, I think my purpose here is to highlight the degree to which this mind and brain is itself open to contestation and being actively contested through these unusual means of, of people building and using technologies. We tend to think of uh, a philosophy of mind as something that gets debated in, in maybe philosophy circles, and of course, it does. And also, it gets debated in this hidden way through you know, the development of use of technologies. And it's that circle, that space of contestation, uh, that I wanted to highlight here. I, I might put you on the spot. Who do you think is doing the, the most far-reaching analysis of basically thought, um, knowing people's thinking, knowing what their thoughts are, where do you think the top research is being done huh. in that field to kind of visualize what's going on in the brain? So and there are a few things that, are go that, I can, that come to mind. The first is that thoughts and what people are thinking 
may not entirely happen in the brain. There are also embodied and social aspects to thoughts and feelings. Um, in that realm, you know, Rosalind Picard and her work at MIT Media Lab has been foundational for like 20 years or so in thinking about what people are thinking and feeling, you know, using the body. So I, I don't think Rosalind Picard thinks about the brain. I think she has really good reasons for not thinking about the brain. Um, but she is the expert in thinking about feelings, detecting feelings um, from, from, you know, worn devices. Um, about the brain in particular, there's a project, you know, there's someone named Jose Carmena at UC Berkeley who's doing this project called Neural Dust, uh, which are, you know, really, really small sensors that can be embedded under, the, inside the brain in the cranium and communicate wirelessly with the receiver on the outside of the cranium through ultrasound. Uh, to me, as far as the brain goes, uh, that is kind of probably the frontier as far as high spatial resolution um, and pervasive sensing inside the brain. What we'll actually learn from neural recording in the brain is still unknown. It's unclear to me what we will learn from that, but uh, certainly from Jose Carmena's perspective, it, it's the frontier in doing something like prosthetics for people with disabilities. Um, and I think it's really interesting work. Great. Thank you so much. Right. Uh, thank you. Nick. Thank you.